Hi, I'm Anna Spencer. Oh boy, we're going to have fun today. I bet you have never attended, nor have I ever hosted, a talk show about whale poop. But that's uh, kind of the opening part for our conversation together. I am pretty sure we'll talk about more than poop. But the whale angle is certainly an interesting one for me. I've never had such a, a, a broadcast in a way before. So I have three experts on whales with me, uh, and we're going to talk about what the research they're doing. Um, and I think I want to go, let's go first to Australia, because that's uh, farthest away. And we have a lady named Edwina Tanner there. It, I guess you're in Sydney, uh, and you're a marine researcher and uh, interested in oceanography and climate change. So this is uh, this is wonderful uh, to uh, have a chance to talk to people who are willing to stay up at 3 a.m. or something in order to be party to a conversation that's much more convenient for us. So hello, Edwina. And in Saskatchewan, we have Chris Chutko, who is a faculty member in uh, geography and planning at the uh, University of Saskatchewan. And uh, so he knows, uh, he teaches a course on uh, global climate change, and uh, I, we'll find out what he, what he has to think about whales. And somebody who really is well known for his work in about whales is Joe Roman, who is a conservation biologist and author who has cons uh, worked on endangered species and marine ecology and he is at the University of Vermont. He has a recent book, which I love, the title, Eat, Poop, Die, How Animals Make Our World. So that's a good introduction to our topic. Uh, let's say, well, let, what, I'll tell you what, that's a good way to begin. Uh, Joe, why don't you uh, give us a quick, uh, um, you know, the kind of blurb that would be on your book saying, What's inside that book, if we opened it? Sure. Thanks, Meta, and thank you for having me on, and it's nice to meet you, Chris and Edwina. Um, yeah, so I I first got the idea for this book. I've been working on whale poop for probably 20 years now, and was giving a talk when I was in Iceland, and uh, um, it was the end of a fellowship year, and I put together a slide, and it was the whales. I was studying where the whales eat where they pooped and where they died. And I said, that has to be the title of my next book. Mm -hmm. um, because the focus there is often we think of as animal animals as sort of passengers on the planet. They might be feeding, they, we think of trees as the lungs or microbes making it, doing essential things in the oceans, both absolutely true. But I think for a long time, we've overlooked the, the role of animals. And one way that they have an influence on, on the world is one metaphor is like the circulatory system. So whales might feed somewhere and poop somewhere else or pee somewhere else or die somewhere else. And that's true not only for whales, but also for seabirds and also for mig other large migratory species like bison. So that's the framework. And then I look at everything from whales to seabirds, to sea otters, to other species. Huh. Okay, well, that is a, a very uh, interesting introduction. Um, let's say, uh, Chris, I'm gonna go to you next, not because I have any reason to think that you have, uh, you're the logical next uh, person, <laughs> but what, well, when you uh, when you have met, maybe you've read some of his work and tell me how it connects with what you're you're doing. Well, my my background's mainly in in environmental change in general, so it doesn't really matter the environment. Most of my background is working in Arctic environments, uh, but now I'm in Central Canada, about as far away from an ocean and whales as you can mm -hmm. get. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, it's it's always interesting because it is a global system and the oceans, the land, what's on the land, what's in the ocean, all these things matter. Uh, and finding ways of integrating everything is critical. Uh, 
Yeah. And um, so I think th that's kind of the background that I'm coming from in this. Well, that's interesting that you mentioned the Arctic because the series that, that we're doing now, I'm doing 35 um, forums on mainly on Arctic um, global warming issues. And um, I, I'm very interested in the, in the impact of, I believe whales have a very important role to play in overcoming stratification of the ocean, that the oceans are stratifying in terms of the top layers getting much warmer than, than the lower levels and that the whales go up and down. And, and so I think that's an important part of climate change. But what I wasn't sure about when I scheduled this was how important are whales in the Arctic? Because I'm very interested in, in trying to see whether anything can be done to keep the Arctic from uh, all melting. Uh, are there lots of whales in the Arctic or, uh, and if so, what kind and, and how, how, how numerous are they in the uh, Arctic Ocean, for example? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I know um, my experience with Arctic whales is more from a, actually a cultural perspective. Uh, especially for local Inuit, they play a very central role, particularly species like bowhead play a very important role uh, um, from a cultural perspective where they are um, uh, hunted and uh, killed and the meat divided up and all parts used, right? Very traditional. Um, I wouldn't call it uh, sustenance, but um, it's part of a cultural ritual. Uh, and so it plays a huge role for uh, physical health, mental health, things like that, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of getting into right, kind of hardcore climate change issues. I see. But well, those things are important too. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and I don't know what uh, what the the uh, physical composition of whale is, I would have assumed that it's, it's 90% fat. Uh, and, and I don't know whether the uh, Inuit would like to, to live on, I guess, a high fat diet anyway. Is that, is that true? Or do, uh, are, are there, you know, what, what is the composition of a, of a, a feast that they would hold with the, with the carcass of a whale? Well, actually, it's um, you're you're absolutely right. The high fat diet is is pretty important um, up there. You know, it's a cold environment. Uh, you burn a lot of energy up there, um, and I think the most uh, one of the the big components of that is is muktuk, which is uh, animal fat. Whether it come from whale, it could come from uh, seals, things like that. So it is part of the diet, uh, a major part of the diet. Oh. Okay. So it is, you say it's, it's, I thought maybe you were implying this mostly a ritual thing and not something that's really part of their everyday food intake. Uh, how often would, if, if, they, if they were really living, living well, how, how often would a, uh, an Inuit person have a, a dinner of uh, muktuk? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but, um, I think the, the whaling aspect of it might be only once or twice a year they're yes. capturing a whale. So it's very low impact overall. But, you know, a lot of diet comes from, mm -hmm. well, at least in terms of country food, uh, it's coming from seals primarily, uh, maybe some musk ox. But um, whale is, well, because it's more difficult to, to get your hands on. Um, so it's not as dominant a food source, but still it plays a important spiritual mm -hmm. role as well. Okay. Well, we'll come back to the Arctic one of these times, but let's go to Australia and find out what the whales are like there. Edrina? Yeah. Um, well, I've, I've kind of come across to whales through a, a different kind of uh, uh, lead, I guess. Um, we do have a lot of whales in Australia. We've got a lot of humpbacks that uh, come up from the Southern Ocean and the populations have been growing and uh, that's uh, fantastic. Um, but my research started um, through looking at uh, kind of a carbon dioxide removal um, process, that looking at uh, how phytoplankton work in the ocean. So I've sort of looked at, at that end and uh, the importance of phytoplankton. 
And um, mm. what we try and do is, is um, through the work that I've done, is, um, you know, make the health of the ocean and phytoplankton um, as healthy as possible. So it was kind of uh, interesting that when I when I talked about my work for a, a long time, I talked to a lot of students and um, told them how important phytoplankton is. And it's really quite amazing that um, I, I happened across um, Joe's work and, and what whales do in the ocean. And the synergy was, um, you know, immediate. It's like, oh, my gosh, you know, what we are doing, we add nutrients to the ocean for, um, to try and stimulate phytoplankton growth and carbon dioxide uptake and sequestration. And um, the the nutrient mix that we sort of happened or, or put together, the, the limiting nutrients in the ocean, happened to be very similar to the nutrient mix in, in whale poo that, uh, that Joe was talking about and the, the researchers um, in Elastic, I think, um, Heidi Pearson's group, uh, are looking at whale poo and, and growing phytoplankton from whale poo. And so there was this immediate um, uh, synergy. So when I started talking to my students about whales and whale poo and what they do, the, the bubbles and the light bulbs that turned on in the room were, were um, you know, it was fascinating. They, they became totally engaged. Um, so you it's mean, just, well, these are students or who? Uh, yeah, a lot of students. And uh, uh, I, I, I go a, a range of students from high school up to uh, university students. Mm-hmm. And, um, you yeah, know, so and, and the engagement was um, just so much more than when I talked about phytoplankton and show pictures of phytoplankton <laughs> and, and, and things on the screen. When I talk about whale poo and, and the, the constituents of whale poo compared to, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, silica, um, they, they, they really got it. So it was... Um, yeah, it was a really happy synergy. And so it's being able to talk about this um, animal or whale that, that people really um, understand and want to know more about and how that interacts with climate has actually just brought a whole new level of um, interest to to um, <laughs> how I talk I, and engage I'm, with I'm, my students. I'm amused at your, your uh, impression about the uh, saleability of talking about phytoplankton because the other day I did a show about phytoplankton and and I I had to give it a name at the first and I said well I'm going to call it phytoplankton now but I'll certainly change it because who would ever want to watch a show called phytoplankton and -hmm. indeed when I uh, really gave it a proper name I called it the whole episode tiny green things Mm -hmm. (laughs) because indeed I don't think anybody would be very interested in phytoplankton but they certainly would be now you have to explicitly point out the connection here if you will for our viewers uh, uh, between phytoplankton and whale poo what is the connection sure so i mean when i first started working uh, studying whales uh tonight in the 1990s it was a north atlantic right whale only about 300 individuals on the planet and uh, it came to the surface with mud on its head or its bonnet, right? So it had been diving 100 meters, 200 meters beneath the surface, came up, breathe, rest. They digest there. It's very energetically expensive to dive. And then they, and then just before it dove again, it released this enormous fecal plume, right? So this big poop that spread out to an area about as big as the boat that we were on. That's interesting. And we actually don't, went in and collected it because we were trying to see what it ate at that point. But um, then when I had learned about this basic process that Chris and that we knew had been studied, the biological pump that most of the carbon and most of the nutrients sink out of the ocean, whales were doing the opposite. They were diving deep to feed and they were rising to the surface there and they were releasing these nutrients regularly, right? Every 20 minutes. And it's not just poop, it's also pee. We just happen to see the poop, but the pee is important too. And when we looked at the chemical composition, you were asking about that earlier, we find, as Edwina said, it's high in phosphorus, nitrogen, and iron, among other other elements. And those are like, in, in the area where I am, in New England, once nitrogen runs out in the summer, then productivity goes way down. Lots of nitrogen. You've got this. You mean phytoplankton productivity? Yeah, for the for the phytoplankton algae, um, the growth in general declines in the summer. But the whales are continuing to feed. That's when they're most abundant, and that's when they're likely to have the biggest impact on that system because they're basically fertilizing their own gardens. Mm -hmm. Um, And the poop is is actually quite beautiful. You know, comes in just about every color. I think of it. You know, (laughs) I'm here in Vermont. And um, 
Snowflake Bentley, the guy who said that every snow you know, crystal is looks different. I think that's the same for whale poop as well. It, it all looks different. You know, it depends on what they ate. It depends yeah. where it is. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's really easy to collect and it floats at the surface. Sometimes I describe it as like an oversteeped green tea. So that makes it hard for the researchers to collect because we want to analyze it and get an idea of where what's in it. And then also if we could do experiments and see how phytoplankton reacts to it um, are big questions. Uh, I'll just add one thing and then we um, is, so we're talking a lot about this pumping system, which is whales diving and feeding, mm -hmm. but you were mentioning the Arctic. I mean, one of the things about many whale species is they migrate, they're the, they have the longest migrations of any mammal on the planet. They can migrate thousands of kilometers every year from mm -hmm. Alaska to Hawaii or from off the coast of uh, Northern Canada. We even just recently, not a migration, we saw gray whales moving between the Pacific Ocean and, and the North Atlantic. They move enormous distances. Really? Yeah, and that is the die part of the book is when whales die, they're, they're, we don't have large trees in the ocean. You're talking about phytoplankton, but we have large animals. Whales being the largest, blue whales, the largest animal ever to have existed in the world. And when they die, more than 100 species have been discovered on their bodies that can only survive, as far as we know, on dead whale bodies. So they're, they're, they're called it's whale fall communities. Some of the, the worms are called osadax or bone eater. They actually don't have a mouth. They don't have a stomach. They don't have an anus. They're using a root system to get at the nutrients within the whale bone, supplying it to, to the bacteria inside of them and then surviving that way. Um, and then finally, you asked about numbers. I, I would say a reasonable estimate is probably about an 80% decline after industrial whaling. This isn't the traditional whaling, which might or might not have had much, but the impact would have been relatively small, Aboriginal whaling in North America or in the Arctic. Industrial whaling, in contrast, brought lots of species to near extinction. Yeah. But Edwina mentioned that one in her area, there's some that are increasing. Isn't that what you said, Edwina? What kind of uh, whales there are? Uh, yeah, it's, so it's... humpbacks have, uh, have made a huge um, comeback, but um, globally, yeah, whale, mm -hmm. whales really still are in decline. And and one of the things you mentioned in the Arctic is um, the stratification or the increasing stratification. And um, so with global heating, this is this is going to be more and more of a problem. Mm -hmm. And whales do have the, you know, they're huge bodies and um, they do um, create a lot of mixing and turbulence in the ocean. So through their migrations. Um, and this is, um, you know, another one of the things, this is what's such so beautiful about whales and, and climate. And you can relate a lot of the functions that are really, really good for the planet um, to what whales are doing. And they've been doing this for 30 million years in the ocean, um, you know, creating good and 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 paving the way for um you know healthy oceans so mm -hmm. really looking at what they're doing is um very important and bringing back the species is um you know building it up from the bottom of the ocean well, that that is, is, is probably something we want to consider late in the talk but i really think that's a good question is it, it i'm already persuaded let's go out and and do things to protect and increase the numbers of whales but how is it is how long is it going to take if we did our very best, and, and what would we have to do to rebuild the world's population of, of whales to the level it was before the, uh, in what you call the industrial uh, whaling mm. operations? Could we do it? And, and uh, how? It's a really tough question, right? Uh, yes, if we have the mindset, we could help many species like humpback whales and blue whales in many areas. But we've mentioned global heating. The truth is that the earth is changing at the same time, even with good laws, which we have, Canada, um, I, Aust all, actually all these, Canada, the US and Australia, all very good laws in place to protect whales. And populations have increased for many species, but not all. I can think of the North Atlantic right whale, 350 animals left, there once were probably 10,000. And good negotiations between the US and Canada to protect these whales from getting hit by ships. The problem is their food moved. They eat copepods, so they eat these small um, these small invertebrates. They went to a new area in Gulf of St. Lawrence, which put them at risk. And then many of them got caught in shipping pots. 
We couldn't see that cut that, you know, there's, there was no model out there to say, this is what's going to happen. We do know animals are going to move with this climate. So there's, I would say there are three things we need to do. One is prevent industrial hunting personally, all for Aboriginal hunting and prevent industrial scale hunting, put in place these protections from fishing or shipping and ocean noise. And then third is get, you know, the control of the climate. We're gonna need to all do all three of those. Can we pull it off? I don't know. I've I, I've been fortunate enough in my career to, st I can tell you that whale populations are better off now than when I was a kid. I grew mm -hmm. up in New York City. I never saw a humpback where there are humpbacks, there are fin whales there. That's a result of good laws to protect them. Also to protect fisheries so they've reduced overfishing because you can if the food if the whales don't have anything to eat it's not going to do much not to hint, um, kill them and then also we've cleaned up our waterways a lot i'm guessing all of us we've probably seen that change in canada as well as australia when i grew up in new york the water was really not a place you wanted to go swimming and now after the clean water act it's actually in pretty good shape well, so i see and, evidence and that whales we can turn need, it around. need a clean environment or they won't go into dirty water is that what you're saying well pollution is going to affect them just like it does us except that is their you know the marine pollution is their environment they're feeding there they're living there all the time so absolutely a healthy environment is going to be essential for anything um, you mentioned whales. something a little while ago about the content of the feces that it, it it's uh, you mentioned nitrogen and iron now uh one of the um geoengineering possibilities that we've been uh, investigating with this series is the notion of ocean iron fertilization, where the theory is, and I, it, it has been tried, I guess, a few times, uh, that there are areas of the ocean where um, all kinds of life is very scarce, and that this is mostly, including, of course, phytoplankton. And because of phytoplankton is scarce, the fishes aren't there either, and so on. But but the reason the phytoplankton is so scarce in these desert areas is the absence primarily of iron, but I guess other things too. And so the the game is to go around sprinkling iron filings, and you can re-establish uh, blooms of phytoplankton. Um, but now I'm wondering, uh, did the in the olden days, let's say when when before industrial whaling. Uh, did these uh, whales uh, keep these desert areas fertile by going there and excreting um, iron or these other substances? And did this uh, keep phytoplankton um, active in, in those uh, areas? I, I'd be happy to go around and room this active area of debate, truth. You know, we could <laughs> you could get five other scientists here and we wouldn't necessarily agree on this. Okay. Um, so the short answer is, from my point of view, we don't know, but we have some ideas. One, whales. The we sometimes we th you say the the ocean. The, the ocean is incredibly patchy, and there are lots of places where a whale wouldn't want to be. There's not enough food. You know, it's not like putting whales there is going to all of a sudden create more food, right? They need the right. Just like we saw the right whales move in response to, they're going to do that. They need to eat a lot every day, like two or 3% of their body weight. So they can't screw around when they're feeding, right? So they need to know but where when the food they, is. It's mostly krill that they eat or what What do they need? Great variety, but, but krill would be typically blue whales. The large whales eat krill. A lot of the right, right whales here eat copepods, which are even smaller. Um, and some fe some feed on fish. On small fish, so herring wouldn't be unusual. Um, uh, anchovies and a variety, mackerel, a variety of species. I, I take krill pills I, every day. What's and that? Somebody told oh, krill, krill oil, mm -hmm. uh, and somebody told me that that wasn't good because I'm taking food away from whales. Is there really an issue that that people that they're you know industrially collecting mm -hmm. krill that uh, the the a actual whales need? I don't want to take food away from a, a good that, whale. <laughs> that's since it's Ed, Edwina's backyard, I'll let her answer that question <laughs> if she wants or she can kick it back to me. No, well, I, I would say uh, the sustainably uh, fish krill. Uh, we have a lot of um, labels in Australia and we have are starting to put sustainable fishing onto um, our fish 
and um, to the point where you can actually find or label the particular fisherman who is actually catching those fish and you know how they're catching them. So this is bringing awareness as to how we are fishing. But we have overfished everything in our oceans, including the krill, and and, and it's not a good thing. So I, I, I took them for a while too and then became a little mm. bit aware of what was happening. Um, the question of iron, though, is, is interesting, and, and that's a, a very big question um, uh, in the ocean. It isn't just limited in iron um, a lot of places. So I kind of look at it a little bit like your body. In you know, 20 years ago, we, we, we would take iron supplements, but now you look at the range of supplements that you can put into your body, right? What does your body need? What is it lacking? It's kind of individual. This is a little bit like the ocean. Different places require different types of inputs mm -hmm. and are lacking in different types of nutrients. So I look at it as its holistic approach. And this is what I think whale poo has to offer it, is it has the right mix of nutrients, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that the ocean needs. So if you're going to go and put iron into the Southern Ocean, which is limiting in iron, and grow phytoplankton just based on iron, you're probably going to leach some nutrients from some other part of the ocean. So the nitrogen and phosphorus have to come from somewhere. So the idea that, um, you know, using whales as a guide to how they are, um, you know, providing nutrients for the ocean is, is really important. And we need to kind of get to the point where this is a holistic system. It's not, you know, put one thing in here and it's going to solve the problem. It, 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 it's more complex than that. So, yes, iron does create nutrient blooms in particular areas that are iron limited. But, you know, other areas of the ocean are nitrogen or phosphorus limited. And you really need to um, look at what you're doing in a holistic approach. So looking at how whales do this, including their movements, their uh, conveyor belt and their, their pumping and their mixing, it, it, it's, they're all really important factors to, to rebuilding the, um, ocean ecosystems. Well, if I'm guessing, you would have us pay attention to where the whales go to eat what. I mean, is is that sort of a, an index of where there's maybe we we could put out a little bit more nitrogen for them, and uh, or and that'd be a good idea there because the whales need uh, mm -hmm. need uh, avoid a certain area that seems to be deficient in nitrogen. Is that the kind of way you would use the whale as a test uh, device? <laughs> Yeah, you might do that. Um, I, I think it's a, a a little bit more complex than that, though. So, um, you know, whales are fertilizing their own patches um, somewhat and, and creating a lot of their own food. So that's good. And, um, you know, that's not the only problem we have in the ocean. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, Tell me about where these whales mostly locate. You say they're moving all over the place. I was, you know, I got interested, I'm especially interested in the Arctic, but I don't know how important uh, or how frequently whales spend time in the Arctic. Is this um, one of the regu regular haunts? Uh, do they do all whales go there? Are there certain species that go there? Or are there not very many whales in the Arctic? Just what, what, what what's the distribution of various whales? Uh, uh, there, there are many, it's, I would say cosmopolitan, but absolutely the Arctic had an enormous amount of whales. It is where the reason why commercial whaling, in part why New England was founded, was because the hunters would first be going up to Norway, up off Greenland, and eventually to North America to hunt whales. They were very abundant. Uh, bowhead whales would be like a classic Arctic species. Gray whales are migrating through that area as well. You've got blue whales, minke whales. So all of the I would not all most of the law and we're we've been saying whales we've we've been so I think we've mostly been talking about what are baleen whales or great whales so right. there's one particular group of filter feeding whales that are the really large bodied ones remember that there are other cetaceans too like killer whales or orcas or um, you know a whole suite of dolphins and others so I think for this conversation we've been thinking about the great whales highly abundant in the Arctic and the Antarctic why? In part because there's a lot of food there. That's that, you know, there is the, the krill that you were just talking about. There's a lot of productivity. It's seasonal, right? So it's in, they're coming there and feeding in the summertime. And for many of these whales, they've got like three or four months, they've got to eat a year's worth of food in three or four mm -hmm. months before they migrate to the lower latitudes where they're going to have 
calves or something like that. So the Arctic and the Antarctic have are essential for whale conservation and protecting them in some semblance. Because if we, I, I don't know what an ice-free Arctic is going to be for whales. It's probably not going to be good for many whales. Similar uh, ice-free, you know, Antarctic with the, the loss of glaciers and there's going to be big changes. Mm -hmm. I doubt it's going to mean more whales. Mm -hmm. And there have been models, you know, we could look at models that suggest that it will have a, a, an impact on whale populations. Do they eat seaweed? Uh, not to my, not, no, most of them are eating, they're eating invertebrates or they're eating fish. I, I mean, inadvertently, yes, but they, you know, so I, the only reason I had to say is like whale sharks will eat phytoplankton. They're not whales, but, you know, another large bodied animal that That's can true. filter through phytoplankton, yeah. but. Uh-huh. Okay. So. Because there's a lot of there's a, apparently an overgrowth kind of of kelp in uh, Hudson Bay at least, and I think mm -hmm. probably other Arctic waters, uh, which you know, I think is very interesting. What we could do with with uh, with kelp there to help create a livelihood for the Inuit who are losing, or the the Cree people who are losing uh, sources of income. Anyway, um, I I don't know. Uh, let me let me ask. <laughs> Let me divert this conversation in a way that I probably shouldn't. I once saw a photo of something that was, I believe it identified it as a whale penis. Now, do whales have penises? And what do they look like? Because the thing mm -hmm. I saw was a really impressive thing. <laughs> and I'm I'm not sure whether the caption under the photo was correct or not, because this was really something <laughs> to behold. Tell me about, do whales have penises? Oh, yeah. They're mammals, just <laughs> like us. And yes, absolutely. And they are the largest penis on the planet. You know, so if you want to go there, yes, whales have large penises. And um, they can move them around like fingers. So they're, you can see them from the surface when a male is trying to mate with a female, you can see the penis up above the surface. We think in some species, the female will be on her back um, and she's trying to maybe possibly try and avoid copulation and only the strongest males with the, that could hold their breasts the longest, their breasts the longest can copulate. Um, they do have the relative to body length, that penis is pretty long, but barnacles are the one if they, if that's sort of the sort of thing that gets you excited. Barnacles, because they can't move, they have very, for their size, they have very long penises because they have to get to the female, you know, they have to but, find a female but, but, over uh, sorry. neighbor without moving. I, I'm lost. Barnacles have penises. No, what what are you saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of them. I mean, but barnacles yes. are like shellfish that attach to a skin or something, mm -hmm. don't they? What am I thinking yeah. of? No, you're thinking of the right thing. They're what, what they the are actually crustaceans, so they're you know they're they're like shrimp. Well, and they have they, they have may big look penises. like uh, other what's that? They have big penises. Relative to their body size, yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know the way. I'm going to stop <laughs> there. I'm going to cut <laughs> myself <laughs> off and let I... it's Chris's turn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say, I shouldn't have or read it, I couldn't help myself. It was, I remember this thing as really astounding. Anyway, <laughs> any you know, after, after the podcast, we can have a long talk about this. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to give you many more details. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, hell, if we're going to talk about poop, we might as well talk about everything else. Fair enough. You mentioned pee. That, that I was true. wondering at the time, what is one of the most beautiful? About... Go ahead. What is so distinctive about whale pee? Indeed. Yeah. I mean, and, and so so this is, we've been talking about this whale pump, right? So yeah. when whales are feeding, they're also pooping. They're just like we do and other mammals do. So they're pooping regularly, maybe once or twice a day. And they're also peeing. But when they migrate, let's say from Alaska to Hawaii, they don't tend to feed in Hawaii and in Southern, in areas that are rather in, in low latitude areas. But all that food that they burn up, they got to burn that to survive. And the, and the moms are also having calves and they're lactating. So burning through tons of energy and that and part of they're releasing the nitrogen and phosphorus and, and other elements through their pee. And recently, we kind of knew this as a model, but recently they've been putting suction cup tags 
on calves so you can see cameras, but like the mom from the calf eye view. And you just see this beautiful curtain of green pea coming from mom. That made my day. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, <laughs> there we go. We have some physical evidence. And the other cool thing about this, when we're talking about how these nutrients move through the system, is you're seeing fish feeding on the skin that's coming from these whales. Remember, these whales have all their nutrients, all their energy comes from the Arctic. They're in the Hawaii or in other low-lying areas, and they're releasing these nutrients. If you've ever been in a low-lying, low-nutrient area, it's those beautiful, clean, blue beaches you know that you've been on. Partly the reason why they're so clear is because there isn't a lot of nutrients, and whales are one way among many for some nutrients to get into that system. So through their pee and also through, through and their carcasses and the placenta. We want them to go foul up these beautiful beach uh, resorts. Is that what you're proposing? By pee, yeah, no, I don't think. I, it's not, it, it, maybe then we're thinking of human sewage on that level. We're not mm -hmm. thinking that's going to be that kind of movement of nutrients to that extent. Uh -huh. It's more likely, could change, but you know that there's going to be an increase in productivity, but I I don't know. If it, I doubt it's going to change that that much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, to what extent would you say, and, and maybe Chris knows, how much has the decline in in whale population in the Arctic affected the, uh, the, the human environment in terms of their livelihood and their um, nutrient uh, fulfillment and so on? How, how much difference uh, is is society affected by the decline in in whales? Um, I I don't know if well I I certainly can't and I don't know if we in general can put a number to it um, because it's part of a natural system, a natural global system. So it's it's a piece of the puzzle. Um, it, it, it's, you know, we can, I, I like to often talk in analogies, it would be similar to deforestation, right? Mm -hmm. We're cutting down trees that take carbon out of the atmosphere by depleting nutrients in the ocean that deplete the ability to take carbon out of the atmosphere and, and store it in the ocean. It's a similar type process, mm -hmm. um, but it's all pieces of the puzzle and they all lead to environmental changes. One thing we have to remember is that Earth has experienced climate change as long as it's had a climate, which is four plus billion years. And humans weren't around for the vast, vast majority of that. Earth took care of itself really well. And it wasn't until we I'm came sure along. I'm sure it'll keep taking care of itself after we have gone. And oh, sure. maybe even better because of our absence, but I just soon hang around as long as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So to that end, I'm thinking uh, you everybody's concerned about the uh, shipping lines and uh, bumping into ships. We're always seeing, you know, reports of whales being you know, killed by bumping into ships or ships bumping into them. Uh, how much can we actually anticipate that and and overcome it? Also, not just, I believe, the physical collisions, but also noise. I've heard that that the sounds that, especially military underwater booms and things like that, it, it really destroys, even kills uh, whales uh, or some seafood. Tell me about that. Um there's also seismic surveys and things like that. So there is a lot of noise going on in the oceans and uh, no, it can't be good for whales. And there is research around this. Um, whale strikes are a real problem. There is um, a number of companies, though, that have come up with some quite novel um, ways to, to look for whales. So um, one thing we do do is we do look out for whales. So we have uh, uh, cameras and AI. We know where whale migration routes are. And we're beginning to um, talk to these uh, large fish shipping companies to, to slow down in these areas, to look out for whales. 
um, there was this graphic picture of a, a large freighter that came in to shore and it had a massive whale on its front dead. And I think having these graphic pictures, um, you know, kind of alerts you to this, wow, this really is a problem. And I think Chile, the government there, has made um, all shipping going into its waters uh, need to slow down and that if you strike a whale that um, you are fined uh, a, a quite a large amount of money. So there are certain um, protocols um, that are coming into effect to kind of help whales out. But that's that's just a tiny drop in the ocean. So, you, you know, <laughs> you, you've got shipping, you've got entanglement, you've got plastics coming into the ocean, you've got um, heating. So, so there's a, a myriad of, um, you know, things that whales need to um, navigate and, and to live through. And, I, I'm, you know, the best way to actually help them out is to to solve some of these problems <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, clean them up. Well, let's let's do it. I'm, yeah. I'm all for it. But I'm, I'm wondering if I were uh, uh, the captain of a ship, how would I know that I'm about to bump into a whale? I mean, especially at night, you're not going to see them. And I think even in the daytime, you don't really see whales. Do you've, you? you've got infrared infrared cameras mm -hmm. and whales um, have they, they spout. So, so cameras are very good at actually um, picking up the uh, signals of, of where a whale is, and you can see them for about five kilometres out. And when seismic surveys have actually uh, been very well regulated um, and they need to stop their survey uh, booming uh, within a five-kilometre range of a whale spotting, and they actually have observers on board that uh, use these particular cameras, infrared, even at night um, and during the day, and they can they can often tell the species of whale by the by the type of uh, spout or signal that it's giving. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a whole company, uh, Whale Seeker, and they're using AI now as well to to kind of uh, figure out where whales are and to to try and give them some space. But uh, look, it's not perfect, but it's a it's a good start. And people are is looking. Is there any way of sending a quiet uh, noise, you know, a low noise saying, hey, I'm coming, toot toot. Uh, you know, watch out, I'm coming through. You so mean... that you can let, notify them to stand <laughs> back. You mean the whales or the yeah. ship? Could, could a ship uh, say, uh, you know, I, I, the, the people working in my yard, if they back up their uh, little ant, uh, digging machine or something, there's a automatically, they put it in reverse and go, beep, 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 watch out behind me, I'm backing up. Mm -hmm. and, and and so you could have that kind of low uh noise if you're going through an area where there are known to be whales or right. where you've got your infrared vision then you could say watch out here i'm coming would that help that, because that technology has been used for fishing gear they're called pingers because often the the dolphins or, or other whales couldn't see or didn't know when they were coming across that. So there has been, and also this is for pinnipeds as well. So there has been some effort to use some sonic warning sound that, you know, this is not a safe place. I will emphasize because I work on these two, you know, I work on two critically endangered species that at this point, today, we have to slow the boats down. You gotta slow the ships down. Sorry, it's not gonna work. They're just they're, we see too many numerous um, uh, hit you know strikes ship strikes every year and mm -hmm. until we have until we're at some place where like okay the technology is locked in and we're good and we can you know all all speed ahead uh, I say we got to keep them at uh, you know ten knots fifteen knots some places you can get this through some places it's voluntary some places it's mandatory um, the problem is. Whales move around a lot. So there this is a big area. You know, we're talking a huge area where whales might be struck by ships. It's not just in the a narrow shipping lane. All that having been said, some other good work that has been done is moving shipping lanes. You know where the whales are, you know where the ships are moving. Adding a dog leg or into Massachusetts made a big difference because they used to go right in the middle of the feeding ground of humpbacks and right whales. And just by, they know where they are. How do they know where they are? By whale watching ships. Just divert a little bit and you can reduce the chance of being struck by 60%. That's not zero, but that's a big number. Well, yeah. Okay. Now, there's no international 
uh, process. I mean, we don't have anything like a convention on whaling and, or uh, any movement to to create such a treaty or something. Uh, I, I've heard for many years that certain countries, I think Japan has a bad record of, of, of doing, you know, continuing to do things they shouldn't do in terms of, of whaling. Is that right? I, I don't know if I would frame it quite that way, but they do continue commercial whaling, yes. And, and Norway and private... Iceland a little bit. Okay, well, so the question is not just moving, well, it's two things, is to try to slow them down and maybe change the location of, of the whaling, I mean, the shipping lanes and stop the whaling. There are people who kept, who are still looking to, what do they do with it? If they, if they, if they uh, kill a whale, what do they use it for nowadays? Uh, Japanese do eat uh, wild meat, and, and I think in Norway as well, so it's quite a delicacy. And um, in fact, uh, I know that they try to get people to, to eat this. Um, I guess research is another reason for killing whales, um, but I don't know how, why you did that many whales um, for research. But, um, yeah, there, there's really no reason for it. We, we have got treaties and uh, there is a big awareness now of what we're doing to wild populations. So, well, how, how big a, a factor is that? Uh, is whaling uh, uh, still a major reason for concern about declining populations? Not really. It's a, the questions we've been talking about: ship strikes, entanglement, climate change. Uh, you know, I would say is a much bigger concern for a typical whale. There are very few nations that are hunting commercially. The numbers are not large. Um, this would not have been true if we were having this conversation in the 1980s when species were near extinction because of commercial whaling. I would argue that, and there is a, it's the International Whaling Commission that put a moratorium on in the 1980s, led by US and Australia and Canada. You know, I don't know about Canada. You guys might have been a little slower on that. Uh, um, and, the, you know, that that helped turn and now the IWC is really focused, this International Whaling Commission is as much focused on, on, on conservation, I would argue, as it is on regulating whaling. There is still, and there's a long story, so I'll try and end it very quickly, but it used to be that Japan had an exemption for scientific whaling, which the US insisted on putting in in the 1960s. So they said, well, we're just doing research. But mm -hmm. then about five or six years ago, they're like, yeah, we'll just leave. The, the, you know, there's been some political changes where some countries just decide they don't have to stay. The reputational damage isn't worth it. So they commercial hunt again, and they just are not part of the, um, you know, a part of that protocol anymore for Japan. And there are enough people in Japan wanting to eat whale meat or fat <laughs> to um, make this worthwhile. It was served at schools, and it was encouraged as part of a cultural identity. Um, for there, so um, I the short answer is I don't I don't know right now. Certainly, there are people arguing both sides of this. The Japanese whaling, you know, the Japanese fisheries agency would insist that this is an important part of the culture that whaling is. They they will say you know no different than hunting any other species. Mm -hmm. um, so you know they they make a firm case, and so here's my dilemma: is that I also support Inuit whale. You know there are places where I think whaling has gone on for thousands of years, port part of the culture. It's no easy way to kill a whale. People know that, so it's there. It's going to be you know it's going to hurt the whale. But they continued hunting bowhead whales in Alaska and Canada, and populations have rebounded because they managed it sustainably. It's not easy, and it's not going to work on a commercial level, I would argue. Mm -hmm. But if you are feeding people locally with the understanding that you're combining both your indigenous knowledge for this as well as some scientific knowledge about the broader area, it can work. Okay. Well, that that's encouraging. Chris might have a you know more specific information on that particular case, but... Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, you, I, I, I just mentioned uh, ritual uh, value that this that there's symbolic meaning somehow in the consumption of of a whale. It, it, can you elaborate on that? I mean, I'm not sure how important that is. If 
if people's whole religion depends on uh, needing whale meat now and then, uh, then we have to think, to factor that in. What what's what's this thing all about, Chris? Well, it's it's like um, if we talk about uh, let's say the 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 Plains Indians from you know the the 16th 17th century hunting bison in the Great Plains and the prairies of Canada, um, all parts were used. Uh, the meat was consumed. The hide was used for clothing and, and things like that, or for shelter, the bones, all that kind of stuff. Bowhead whale play the same role in Inuit culture. Mm -hmm. um, so there are still sites up in, uh, as an example, in the, the village of Resolute, which is in the central part of the Canadian Arctic, where you can go see kind of prehistoric um, Inuit shelters. And they are framed with bowhead uh, bones. So it plays that role. It, it's central to the, the history of those people. You have to remember, this is an incredibly hostile environment. Um, mm -hmm. And you got to make do with everything you have. There's no, there's, there are no trees. So there's no lumber, right? Okay. Um, so mm -hmm. this is where you get your stuff from. But this is still then not just ritual, or is it still a very important part of their cultural life? You mentioned, yeah. uh, apart from their physical sustenance. Yeah, absolutely. It's a community event, um, you know, which is really important. We're talking about very small communities. The village of Resolute is about two hundred people, mm -hmm. um, and you know, very um, exposed now to western foods things like that which tend to be high sugar mm -hmm. um so issues around diabetes are, are really big in that part of the world um and so this this is a community event brings the community together it shares in that tradition that they uh, they have they've been living up there for potentially ten thousand years doing those types of practices and so it brings the community back together um, to focus on, you know, what matters to them and what the elders are trying to pass on to the next generations. Um, so it plays a very, very important role there from a, a mental health, a physical health, a cultural health perspective. Do you spend time in, in these communities? Do you know these people well or any one of them, any one community? Uh, I haven't done that in, in a number of years, so I've lost touch with people. But when I was up there, yeah, we spend time in the communities. Most of it is you're spent time just out on the land. Um, but you definitely meet up with people and kind of engage. Like ask, this isn't exactly relevant to Wales, but uh, I'd like to ask your opinion about the the belief system about climate change that you are aware of among the elders. And I don't know whether the... Inuit have the same uh, authority system in, in recognizing the importance of the elders' opinions. But uh, I, I have a, a friend who appears occasionally. He's a Cree Indian leader, uh, climate change activist. And, and, and he says that one of the things he finds is among the Cree communities, the elders tend to say, well, global warming is is part of nature and we shouldn't try to interfere with it uh yes it's hard for us now and it's wiping out our livelihood and, and all kinds of things are difficult about it but if you offer them any kind of uh, possibility of, of of changing it or preventing it or interfering with the tendency of global warming in the arctic they'll say it's part of nature's way should we should just let it happen uh, and I don't know whether that's true. He didn't say whether that was the case among the Inuit. He just said that, that it was because as a climate change activist, he has to try to change people's opinions, you know, and, and get them on board with certain um, interventions that might be useful. And and he's having a hard time doing it. Um, so is that true, would you say, of the Inuit communities as well? Uh, I think you could argue that for any community. 
there's going to be people in any community that are going to take one side or the other. Um, yeah, climate change is natural if we let it play out and um, kind of in terms of the way that nature intends for it to play out, you know, not a problem. It's the human impact. And when you go to the high Arctic of Canada or, uh, well, let's just talk about Canada, um, you don't see the industry. You don't see uh, the source of the impacts, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the sky in the Arctic is the most brilliant shade of blue I've ever seen. Um, you don't see it. Um, but then they hear these stories that, oh, you know, temperatures are going up. And then they realize, you know, there's no roads. They need to use the sea ice to get from community to community or to get from their community to their hunting grounds. And now the sea ice is starting to change. Mm -hmm. And it's not as reliable. Um, the snow is different, uh, different texture. Um, they can't get to where they need to go. The weather is starting to change. They notice it. Right. We can say the same thing. I do a lot of work in indigenous communities here in Saskatchewan as well. And, you know, the same stories. And these are communities that are not the source of mm -hmm. the impact. And so there's a lot of, uh, I don't want to call it confusion, but a little bit of a disconnect between what's actually happening versus where it's coming from yeah. and what the source is. And so education is by far a really critical component of this. What's actually happening? That's what I spend a lot of time doing is just talking to communities and trying to lay out the details. Right. Well, that's, we need to come back another time for, for a full conversation about that kind of thing. It's certainly very crucial. In fact, we should almost always have an indigenous person with us on any of these shows because their point of view is so relevant that, you know, it's their, their land and their country. Uh, and uh, we have no business going in trying to make any impact there unless we consult them. But I, I must say, I don't, it's not so easy to, to recruit people to participate in these shows. Well, I, I feel like the, the whale is our, is our Indigenous representative in this. It's, it's the same thing. We're going into their area and their place and uh, we need to keep them as uh, you know the indigenous knowledge of of the ocean well uh, which people are you talking about in your part of the world what what are the indigenous communities that are really uh, affected by uh, some of the changes that you're working on either implementing or trying to prevent well I think it's um, a lot of the fishing communities so um, they do notice that the, the fisheries are depleted and um, this is something we really need to work on is, is you know, how to get uh, more equitable fishing to to people that really need it and people that survive on, uh, you know, the fish of the sea rather than just the industrial fishing people who seem to be taking uh, oh, yes. a lot of the resources. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. mm. Okay. Well, we have a lot more to talk about, but uh, this is a, a great start to talk about the importance of whales in our environment. And I think everybody listening will realize that whales are not just an odd thing that we can, can contemplate from a distance, but people that are creature, creatures that affect our own lives now in various ways that we probably weren't aware of before. At any rate, I'm becoming aware of that. So I thank you all. Anybody have anything you want to add before we say goodbye? All right. I appreciate this very much. It's been fun. So uh, I'll send you the link, and uh, thank you very much, okay? Project Save the World produces these forums, and this is episode 593. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website, to savetheworld.ca. People share information there about six global issues, and we welcome your comments, too. To find a particular talk show, check the scroll list on the homepage, or use the search bar. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine, which now serves as a free of charge newsletter to help mobilize knowledge about six global threats to humankind. We gladly email the magazine as a PDF or link to any 
or interested organization in the world that works to prevent a global catastrophe involving war and weapons, global warming, famine, pandemics, radioactive contamination, or cyber risks. Just email us at office at peacemagazine.org dot org that's office at peacemagazine.org and we'll add your group's email address without charge to our list please type subscribe my group as the subject of your email for individual subscriptions at twenty dollars canadian per year go to pressreader.com on your browser and search for peace magazine